Good evening. My name is Mike Guile, and I'm one of the co-chairs of this organization. We've had an opportunity today to have a workshop and also visit with some other people, and I've heard from our speakers, who you're going to hear from more tonight about, or from, talking about their areas and what they've done. And I think what you're going to hear and what you'll leave with is a concept, a concept which is really the first step of moving ahead with some regionalization, some planning, some discussion to working together that needs to happen for Northern Colorado to be successful. And again, as I've mentioned earlier, this all started when the state demographer said that this area, this area that we're in, its, it's population is going to increase between 750,000 and a million people by the year 2050. And the reason why I got involved with this project is because of that. I have backgrounds that can be helpful to this organization and experiences, but I also feel I have an obligation to come forth and do everything I can to help this community come together and start working. Because if we don't, can you imagine what it might be like serving a million people in the next 40 years and what could happen if we don't sit down and try to do it right? So. On behalf of myself and the, uh, what's the organization again? <laughs> Board of Directors, we want to welcome you and thank you for attending. And please, enjoy this tonight because it's going to give you, I think, some very, very strategic information. But I'd like to introduce John Daggett, who's the Executive Director of... Thank you. It's interesting, isn't it? Okay, well, I just want to sort of try to frame things for you. We have a, we have a wonderful uh, s uh, couple of keynote speakers tonight in Robert Grow and Boo Thomas uh, from Louisiana and from Salt Lake City um, who will um, entertain us, inspire us, um, inform us, and maybe even frighten us a little bit in, in terms of, but that's probably be my job this evening is to uh, set the stage for that. Um, so we live in a changing world um, and things all around us are changing and things are changing in northern Colorado. Uh, for those of you who were at the workshop today, a lot of the same slides, so I apologize. Uh, and I'll go quickly, but I, I do want to share this with the larger group. Um, we're here to listen. We're here, and if you look in the back of the room, we're here to listen to lots of people. Um, not just people with a particular perspective, one perspective or another. We're here to listen to lots of folks. And I think it would be true for me to say, and I'll, I'll say this for the board as well, that um, if you're a business person and you want to make business work in Northern Colorado, we're your biggest supporter. If you are an environmentalist and want to preserve and enhance the natural beauty of this place, we are your biggest supporter. If you are raising the kids and you're a family man or woman, we're your biggest supporter. We, we want to help bring together this community um, in a way that um, it, it's been difficult to do over the past um, few years. So since our world is changing, I just thought I'd introduce you to these two young girls. Um, it's Mackenzie and Matilda. They live here in northern Colorado. Um, and most of the information that I'll give you tonight um, will be um, uh, forecasted to the year when they're about 45 years old, um, so that you have a feel for that. And they're, they're darling kids. So um, we also had a group of CSU students help us today, and they will be 60 years old when uh, these things come to pass. Of course, they're 20 now. 1.4 million people in Larimer and Weld counties um, is the state demographer's forecast. Um, this chart is a simple chart of growth that's projected by the state demographer. The blue line is Well County, the red line is Larimer County. Uh, nobody wins necessarily um, in terms of having that many people here, but there are ways um, to work towards having quality growth um, in the future. Another way to look at it is that um, up until 1970, it took us about till that uh, period of time to have 180,000 people in both counties. Um, we added 400,000 in the last 40 years. We will add 800,000 in the next 40 years, or at least that's the prediction. Lots of people coming to live with us. Um, 
in the year 2011. Oh, it's 2011. We forgot that we were all getting older and that big spike in the middle of the chart are people turning 65. So you will see that that trend continues on into the future, in the foreseeable future. Um, and so uh, some, of the, some of the data behind that is that uh, by the year 2015, um, every 15 minutes a child will be born and every 15 minutes two people will turn 65. Um, so you kind of get the sense of where that's headed and what we're doing. By the year 2030, there'll be three times as many people over, over the age of 65 as there were in the year 2000 living in Colorado. Um, the, the U.S. Census Bureau tells us that in 1970, about 9 percent of our population was 65 or older. Um, in the year 2050, 17 percent, uh, a complete doubling of that. Um, our households are changing. Um, the blue uh, bars are um, 1970, the red bars are 2006. And uh, what you see along the bottom of the chart is one person, two person, three person, and four plus. That's the number of people that are living in households. What that means is that um, in 1970, uh, uh, the change between 1970 and 2006, there's been a big increase in Northern Colorado, in Colorado in general, in one person per household families, um, uh, households. Um, two-person households, but a big drop off in larger families, which is the trend that's going on across the country and is no different here. Um, all of these demographic changes also have impacts on, on, um, on the various systems that are here. This, is, uh, this uh, chart happens to be about transportation. So these are person trips. In 1970, we barely uh, made six or seven hundred thousand person trips a day. A, trip, a person trip is if I leave my, my home and I go to work, that's a person trip. So that population didn't take very many. But by 2050, there will be five million person trips a day in northern Colorado. Can't imagine how people are going to get around, how congested the roads are going to be um, with that many more times. Um, uh, the amount of vehicles or people on transit, tra on transit trying to get around or bikes or walking. Water is the same way. And th those charts look very similar, don't they? Um, the the uh, Natural Resource uh, Law Center in, at CU tells us that we use about 208 uh, gallons of water a day in Colorado per person. Um, we do a little bit better in Fort Collins and Greeley and Loveland than that number. Um, but based on that average, um, we will use somewhere in excess of 320 acre feet of water, or need 326, uh, I'm sorry, 326,000 acre feet of water. Um, and what that means in real numbers, in terms of gallons, is multiply 320,000 acre feet times 326,000 gallons and you will get the number of gallons of water that likely would be consumed at that rate. So there are impacts to growth as we move along, and so um, we wanted to raise those issues with you. But I wanted to share with you that there are lots of things that happen over a 40-year period of time. And the first thing is an IBM 370 computer and an iPad. Uh, one's in 1970, one's in 2010, and you, you can see the one on the left, let's see, the one on your right um, is, an, is the iPad, which is about a million times more powerful um, than the IBM 370 computer was in 1970. So you can get a feel for that as we move forward. Chevy Impala, great car in 1970, 14 miles to the gallon, polluted like crazy. Uh, our C CO2 problems that we've just recently resolved were a part of that great engine that they had in that car. Went really fast, used a lot of gas. Um, in 2010, we have an Impala that has navigation systems, sunroof, uh, MP3 players, um, uh, individually climate controlled um, uh, adjustments on the dash of your car and gets 20, 29 miles to the gallon and bar barely pollutes at all. So we've made some progress in that 40 years, but that's how quickly that turns around. 
phonograph player, MP3 player. 50, on the MP3 player, there's 50,000 songs and photos and videos. On the phonograph, you have to flip that record over to get to the, the sixth cut on the record, you know, and, and you wear it out. It runs out of, of, of steam. In 1970, we had x-rays in hospitals. Uh, today, we have CT scans. One's a two-dimensional uh, tool, good technology. Um, saved a lot of lives, um, repaired a lot of bones. But the CT scan will take 3D images of your brain and your arm and your leg and your foot and uh, goes a long ways to, into, into helping us uh, recover from injuries and disease and that sort of thing. So um, the last few slides. So we are a part of an emerging mega region. That region runs from Pueblo, Colorado Springs to Fort Collins, Greeley, Cheyenne. Um, and what demographers tell us is that 50% or more of the growth in the United States will occur in these regions in the, over the next century. What they also tell us is that 66% of the economic growth um, in America will occur in these mega regions. We are in the top 11. Um, I think if you include Salt Lake, we're in the top 12, um, something like that. But we're really close to that top 10, breaking through that top 10 barrier. If that's where most of the growth is going to occur, then there are implications for that growth as well. There are also opportunities. So people will have greater employment opportunities and greater uh, opportunities for recreation and culture and the arts and all of that. So it's, it's not all negative even though it is a challenge as we move forward. So these last set of, gra or of maps that I wanted to share with you, I wanted to start with that background color is, is actually green on my screen. I don't know if it's really green on yours. But there are three colors there, green uh, the, or the light beige, um, a yellow color and a, and a red color on these maps. And they, they really refer to rural agricultural areas, the green. Uh, yellow is exurban, which is the 35 unit parcel that gets developed in, in uh, large um, estates. And then the red is the urbanizing areas. So I'm going to take you through about 80 years worth of this so that you can get, kind of get a feel for where we've been and where we're going. Um, this uh, set of data was um, compiled by Dr. David Theobald at Colorado State University. And he probably guessed wrong, but it's an educated guess in terms of what will happen in the future. And certainly we can refine this as we go. So 1960 is what we looked like then. Um, and as we go through the decades, 70, 1980, and you can see the growth beginning to occur in northern Colorado, 1990, 2000, 2010, and these are now projections, 2020, 2030, 2040. Where did that, all that rural agricultural land go? Um, his, his projection is that it disappears on us. I don't know that that necessarily is a foregone conclusion or, or something that we necessarily have to accept, um, but it is a projection, a, a guess in terms of how the future looks. Um, I'm going to go back to 1960 so we can compare 1960 to 2040. Here's 1960. And here's the growth projected through uh, 2040. So you get a f kind of a feel for um, what's coming our way. 1.4 million people has a, a pretty Im a big impact in terms of development. So that's my presentation. And um, what I'd like to do is uh, turn this over to Angie Maluski, uh, give her a, a, a warm round of, up, up, of applause. She is the co-chair for Embrace Northern Co for Embrace Northern Colorado. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, John. So how do you guys feel after that? Who feels good? That was a downer, huh? <laughs> well, we didn't, we didn't bring you here to uh, ruin your evening. I'll, I'll assure you of that. We actually have some good things to say as well. Uh, John's trying to give us some context on what the statistics the demographers are telling us are, he are headed our way. Um, you know, Mike asked or mentioned a bit of why he's here, why he's doing it why he's doing this, why he's a part of this group. And I'll tell you why I am in doing it. Um, 
I, I'm, a, I'm a mother. I have ch small children in the school system here in Northern Colorado. I'm a business person. I have a business here. Most of my clientele is within Northern Colorado. Uh, I'm also a landscape architect, so I'm a planner, which, okay, that makes it easy. I, I, I think planning's important, so that makes it easy for me. But um, really, the time is right. I'm, I'm not alone here. We're not alone with this, with this group and what we're saying and why the time is right now to have this happen. Uh, the two community foundations are here today. They have been working together uh, across the region in an unprecedented way in the past few years, so we applaud them for that. They see the value of working together. Uh, our three chambers, the Fort Collins, Greeley, and Loveland chambers, have come together as well in the last few years, uh, just seated their second um, leadership Northern Colorado class. Uh, had a great speaker uh, within the last two weeks on that, and so we applaud their efforts as well. It's becoming an issue. It's becoming something that we all realize that, uh, that the time is right to begin this regional dialogue. So again, we have two speakers tonight, not just one, but two speakers, and we have them here because they've been through this before. This may be new and daunting for us, but they've been there, they've done that. They have some uh, good uh, examples and challenges and more importantly some great successes to share with us and so we're looking to them to hear from their experiences tonight uh, we'll hear first from Robert Grow and then from Boo Thomas and then we'll have a chance to have some questions and answers with both of them so uh, <clears throat> so I have the pleasure first of introducing uh, mr. Robert Grow he is the founding chair and the current chair of Envision Utah uh, this is a public-private quality growth partnership. It's been, it was founded in 1997 with Robert's help. But most importantly, it's really nationally recognized as, as uh, just the gold star in this sort of an effort. Uh, one of the most successful public involvement efforts that has, has occurred. It has won many national uh, prestigious planning awards. Um, in fact, uh, the Michigan Land Institute called it the planning equivalent of four Oscars. These guys uh, know what they're doing, and Robert is asked to speak uh, across the country. He's a fantastic speaker. I know you're going to enjoy him. So again, it's a privilege to have him here with us tonight. Please help me welcome Mr. Robert Groh. Well, it's great to be here. John just reminded me there are question sheets. If you, where, where are they, John? Um, they were at the entrance. Yeah, did, we're going to pass them out. So if you have a question while we're talking, don't forget it. Write it down, and we'd be glad to try and answer it later. Um, I want to start with a story. A few years ago, there were a couple of men out on the savannas of Africa hunting, and they just got up for breakfast. They hadn't put their shoes on yet. They were a ways away from their rifles, and they saw a large, hungry lion headed their direction. And he obviously hadn't had breakfast either, and so the two of them couldn't get to their guns and took off running. One of them saw a small sort of spindly tree and scampered up the tree just out of the lion's grasp. And the other one, recognizing the tree was too small for both of them, kept running. He saw a cave in the side of a hill and dove in the cave. So the lion rushes the tree, scratches at it, can't get the first guy. And the guy in the cave comes out of the cave and the lion, lion rushes him but he jumps back in the cave and the lion goes back to the tree and goes after that guy and the man comes out of the cave, he gets rushed again and this goes on a couple times. The friend in the tree shouts to his friend in the cave, you better stay in the cave or the lion will eat you. And his friend shouts back, you don't understand local conditions, there's a bear in the cave. <laughs> so I don't understand your local conditions and I hope you'll uh, approach this with some uh, forgiveness in your heart if I, if I veer off into things that uh, may not make sense to you, just please ignore them and I'll try and uh, talk in a way which will be helpful. I'm, I'm a process engineer who became a lawyer, so I'm sort of an architect of, of, of processes. And so what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to use Envision Utah as an example, but it's only an example. It's a way of doing things that brings regions together and it survived and succeeded in probably the most conservative place in America and has not only survived but thrived and made real change with the help of a huge community that has supported it. So that's what I'd like to talk about tonight. Now, growth is coming here. It's been coming. It's predicted to keep coming because this is a great place to live. And you only have one choice. 
Uh, under the Constitution, people have a right to live where they want, go where they want, and you can stop the growth only if you make this a bad place to live. Now, that has some bad consequences for you, too. So it's coming. This is about how you handle it, accommodate it, live with it, and manage it. The process of regional visioning is really a very powerful tool to meet difficult challenges, and there are some, and how to create sustainable communities in the future. And there are a number of challenges that we face right now. One of them, uh, and regardless of your views about global climate change, by the way, we now have found absolute proof that global climate change is real. <laughs> all right, think about it. <laughs> Moving on. So climate change, carbon footprint, all those things. Another trend has been the energy prices. I was making this chart in 2008 and quit because I got so discouraged. Prices came back down, but how many of you think prices will be up in 10 years? Yeah. We've learned how to uh, feed our cars the same fuel we, we eat ourselves. And uh, if, if any of you watch futures markets, corn is four times as much this year as it was. This corn harvest, when the next crop comes in, there will only be 20 days of corn left on the planet to give you an idea of what's going on with commodities and food. Uh, a friend of mine who sells 100,000 cattle a year said, you better be planning on raising your food budget. But it's because we're turning it into energy now, and the world market has grown. Another major change has been housing prices have been out of control. They've tempered a little bit, but not that much in most regions of the country. This is my favorite postcard from Florida. Finally found a place I could afford. Another population uh, change that is demographic that's going on, and, and John showed my slide. Um, how many of you resemble this chart, that jump? How many of you, are, your, your father came home from the war? I mean, you wonder what demographers in the United States thought in 1947 when they figured out what the birth rate had been in 1946. You know, they said, is that a trend? That is frightening. But that's, uh, that's what set that off. And I was, I was the second in the family, so I was born four years later. Another major trend has been this deep recession, job loss, difficulty in attracting good jobs to regions. It's clearly a buyer's market if you're looking to side a new plant. And I'll say this up front, the fundamental advantage to Envision Utah over the last four years has been when companies have been looking for a place to site, we've been able to show them how much difference it would make if they come to a region that has a plan, where the state is fiscally sound, and where, where we're dealing with the challenges of the future. It's been a tremendous advantage. Lots of our business has come out of California. I know, I know this one's frozen. I apologize. Watch this screen. Um, we'll see if it unfreezes. It probably won't. So all of these aspects of what people look for in a place to site are, are, have to do with the quality of the region in which you live. Another impact is, uh, is just the increase in congestion. I don't know how many rush hours you have around here, but you certainly have rush minutes now getting into longer term periods. This is Dallas, 1999. The red lines are streets that are over capacity. With all of the money they can possibly spend, that's 2030. And that's the trend in every state in the country. So the goal is to find sustainability given these issues and many more that we're dealing with. We heard a lot about water this afternoon in your region. So what is sustainability? This is the definition from the Hawaii 2050 Sustainability Plan, and I like it because it's got three components. The middle component's the standard definition. It's about finding the right balance between jobs and the economy, social issues and community, quality of community, and environmental priorities, getting those things in balance. The last definition is from the United Nations in 1986. It meets, meeting your needs today without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. In other words, not to leave burdens for our children and our grandchildren. But interestingly enough, they've added a new leg to the sustainability chart, and it's number one. To respect their future, they want to respect the culture, character, uh, beauty, and history of their state's island community. And one of the things I saw today as we had a workshop was how many things were listed that you wanted to protect that are unique and special to this place. And so every place has a history. Every place has a reason people came. And making sure those things are preserved and protected are as important as balancing these other big issues as you go forward into the future. So how do you do that? Well, regional visioning is actually a new, really scientific approach to solving problems. Take the problem at the right scale. If you're dealing with air, air quality, deal with the air shed. If you're dealing with water quality, deal with the watershed. If you're dealing with transportation, deal with the commuter shed. 
And so it's about solving problems at the right scale. And many of our governmental entities today are not at that scale. It's just a fact of history that that, that has not changed, and I don't believe it ought to change. Local governments ought to stay in control of what they're in control of. But everybody needs to understand the bigger picture and make decisions in that bigger context. And so this is about solving problems at the right scale to get the best answers. And if you do that, it really empowers your region to improve and enhance its quality of life and to compete successfully for the jobs you so much want in the future. By the way, what's probably the biggest myth about growth in northern Colorado? I'll bet it's that you don't go home and look in the mirror and say, I am responsible for this growth problem. How many of you have children? Raise your hand if you have children. How many of you want your children to stay? Raise your hand. OK, tonight go home in the mirror after this, look in the mirror and say, I am the problem. I own this growth issue. I need to help fix it. That's the most important thing your region needs to do. That was every speech and vision you started with, you think it's those Californians coming. It's not, OK? Particularly in Utah, it was not. So, so what is visioning? It's an analysis of alternative scenarios, virtual crash dummies of the future, scenarios of what it may look like, so you can make wise decisions in the face of uncertainty. This is not about predicting the future. It's not a forecast. It's a way of looking at the future and picking the best strategies because we don't know the future. How many of you took all your money out of the stock market three years ago? Raise your hand. Yeah, 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 not very many of us, huh? Not me. So we don't know the future. This is about finding the best way to face it without knowing for sure. But we can know a lot. Now, so why do we do this? We do it to help the public and today's decision makers to, make, to understand the long-term consequences of their choices. Not to tell them how to decide things, but to provide them with information to make good choices. And when we do it, we look at a certain distance. We had some college students helping us today, and I joked with them that long-term thinking was, what am I going to do Friday night? Now, I don't know about you, but then I got married, and we had some children. And then I started to wonder, what would life be like when they were my age? And then, lo and behold, my children grew up. And they got married, and they started to produce grandchildren. You can ooh and ah anytime you want. OK. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Now, I'll tell my wife you ooh and That'll make you her favorites. Uh, the little boy and little girl uh, on the right-hand side speak fluent Mandarin and have been growing up in Beijing. So my family is scattered around the planet, but the fact that I have so many means that I owe it to the planet to be involved in get making life better. See, but this is who I think about. What will their be life, life be like when they're my age? The little boy in the red shirt is exactly 50 years younger than me, two generations. And I think about him when I think about what we ought to do. And so I, I'd suggest you think that way. This is about long-term thinking. This is not the fight over what the school budget is next year. This is not over whether I built this road or that road. It's about vision. It's about where do we want to go long-term so that their lives are good and have the high kind of quality we've been blessed with in our lives. Uh, Envision Utah actually based, was based on our sort of history. This is a, uh, an artist's rendering of the first two Mormon pioneers in Salt Lake Valley. My great, great, great uncle is the guy hogging the horse. Um, and his name was Orson Pratt. And if you, if you look at this picture, oh, by the way, this horse was Utah's first high occupancy vehicle. They shared it as they went around the valley. But that's how our valley looked when we started out. Within a few years, you know, the, within six months, 2,000 Mormon pioneers arrived in one wagon train with little food. Okay, they barely, almost starved to death during the first winter. They learned to cooperate because survival depended on working together. But we sort of lost that part of our history. And by 1997, we were going to add another million people by 2020, sort of like your growth patterns. Our air quality was getting worse. We were going to double the amount of urban land. We needed new water. We were getting more crowded and congested. Business and personal costs were rising. Our infrastructure needs. I know you have all the money you need to build infrastructure here, right? No shortage of money. OK, well, we, 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 we had a big shortage of money and still do. So it was about we needed to find out how to spend our money right. So Envision Utah was founded in 1997. It's a nonprofit like Embrace Northern Colorado. It is run as a nonprofit without a perspective or choice or position. It is about bringing people together and setting the table. And we, we help people get excited about our growth. We showed them this picture of Philadelphia and said, that's what the, how big the greater Wasatch area will be in 2050. Any of you from Philadelphia? 
Philadelphia. I apologize for this picture, but this scared the daylights. You want northern Colorado to look like that in 70 years? So we have choices, and our decision was to take on those choices. Now, our challenges were fairly daunting politically. There were 10 counties, 90 cities and towns, 157 special service districts, all supplying things to, our, things to us and in charge. 500 city council members, 500 planning commissioners, 30 county commissioners, 90 mayors, hundreds of developers and uh, realtors and others and other key stakeholders. Uh, this is uh, one of my favorite cartoons that was in the newspaper when we were starting. Vision Utah's The Big Bad Hunter. What's he got behind his back? A handful of carrots and a gun. And he's talking to the cities and the cities say, oh good, I get a choice here. There was some political fear at the beginning about who we were and what we were up to. And we promised the cities that we would never infringe on their jurisdiction in land use planning and have not to this day and they have remained fully supportive and now they all use our toolbox and support us and we're moving forward. But there was this kind of concern at the beginning. We actually created it to keep planning at a local level. In Utah, Smart growth at this time was considered to be an intellectual fetish of a self-selected liberal eastern elite. <laughs> Want me to say that again? Smart growth was an intellectual fetish of a self-selected liberal eastern elite. Now that wasn't true for all Utahns, but it was for many. And so this was about us finding our own way and learning how to solve our problems at the local level, but us all understanding the impact of our decisions. And Vision Utah has absolutely no governmental authority of any kind. By the way, Brigham Young showed up at our first meeting and said, what the heck did you do to my nice street system? Okay. <laughs> now, who do we bring together? Business leaders, developers, utility companies, local and state government, conservation groups, religious leaders, education, media, and so on. We tried to get anybody who was e could either affect the growth patterns or was going to be affected by them. And we set the biggest table we could. This is not about inviting your friends. This is about inviting everybody who cares. And it was the broadest group ever brought together in Utah. We had an organizational behavior professor tell us we were crazy. There was no way to manage this group. We didn't manage this group. We learned from them. We worked with them. Uh, they taught us. And they figured out the future of our region working with the public. So we tried to design a different process. The traditional planning approach in America has been somebody decides to research and analysis what the right answer is to a problem. Then we educate the public about the solution. We announce the plan we've decided on. Then we defend the plan because we didn't involve people. That usually has a very untoward effect <laughs> on the plan. And so we redesigned the plan, mainly because in Utah, 42% of the people said, we're in charge of what happens with growth. Not state government, not local government, not businesses. All of them matter. But the people are the ones who want to decide. So the premise of Envision Utah was the public has the right to choose the future, and public officials sh should serve that vision. It's getting them to understand the choices so they can make the choices that the public officials can follow. So the public will make good choices if you present them with real options. That's the premise. You have to trust people to make good choices, and our experience is they did. So the process was figure out what people in our region valued. What were their hopes, dreams, and aspirations for themselves and for the children? And then to look at the choices with scenarios. And from those choices, let them create a vision. And then we develop strategies to Im implement that. There were six major goals, 42 strategies we've been following for about 13 years uh, since we started out and have made a fair amount of progress. Now, please don't be offended if I start skipping slides, because I always have more slides than I can ever use. So uh, th this will all be on the website if, you're, if you want to go through it in more detail. So I want to show you. Uh, the kinds of things came out of the values. People wanted to be places to be spiritual, places for introspection and pondering, physical wellness. But it was mainly about personal growth and well-being as we studied our community. They wanted great education, neighborhood schools, great higher education institutes, and lifelong learning. They wanted community identity and activities. They wanted places to interact with their, their community. And they wanted to be neighborly. They wanted to know who lived next door and be friends. They wanted contemplative settings and environmental preservation. They wanted especially access to nature, not to lock it up. But it was about a nature, not the environment, was the word they used. They wanted time together and family interaction and quality recreational activities. Anything sound good to you? 
you know, actually we share a lot of things between Utah and Colorado. We're, we're, we're Westerners too, you know. We, so eyes on the street, fewer accidents, safe places so you have peace of mind. You want to live in wonderful communities now that are very safe. You want to preserve that. So we studied those values. We drew them out of hundreds of workshops that we did with thousands of participants. We did some studies. I'm going to skip through this, except I'm going to get to one chart and show you something. Okay. This is a values map for Utah. This is a mind map for the way Utahns think. So the governor saw this and said, this is the road map to be an elected governor again. Uh, but I want, to, I want you to look at how this works. The bottom level are things about our community that are sort of the fact, like traffic, congestion. The next level up is how that impacts you. The third level up is how you feel about it, or how it, emotionally. And the last level up is values. So how many of you like congestion or traffic? Anybody? Why do we hate traffic? Well, look at the chart in Utah. It saves time. Well, we always say it positively. It steals your time. Right? If I gave you back the two weeks you spent in congestion last year, what would you do instead? Well, in Utah, we would do other things. We would spend it with our family. We'd have less stress. Stress if our job, if our boss is next to us, we say we would do a better job at work, and so on. And that all leads to peace of mind. Now, you use that because it not only told us what we wanted about our region, but why we wanted it, why it emotionally impacted our people, and why at the ultimate values level they were concerned about it. And we used this all the way through to understand what we were trying to protect and preserve. We wanted safe, secure communities, great personal opportunities for ourselves and our children. We wanted culture. You know, we wanted to make sure that our communities were particularly of the kind where everybody got along and were friendly and so on. Um, from that, Envision Utah set out to make Utah more beautiful, more prosperous, more neighborly. Those were our, our key words. Now, I'm going to skip a few of these. Now, you do this, once you understand what people want, you start playing with scenarios. And scenarios take environment, transportation, and land use, and they change them in different ways, and you model it, and you say, well, how much energy are we going to use? How many jobs can we create? What kind of job environment are we creating? What kind of air quality are we going to have? How much land are we going to consume? How much agriculture will be left? How much traffic are we going to have? How much water are we using? How many miles do you have to drive to get to where you want to go? What are your housing opportunities? How much, what's your carbon footprint? Those are all things you can model along with about 20 other things. And so you go from discussing things at sort of a, uh, an argumentative level to a whole bunch of facts about if we make this choice, we'll end up here. If we make this choice, we'll end up here. Well, what do you think? Where you can really see how much difference it makes in those different virtual futures. If you're going to make a mess of your region, do it with a virtual computer model and all the qualitative facts about it, and not do it in reality. So this is the best way to bring a region together is through scenarios. And I'm going to skip. These are Sacramento's, just to show you. This is going on everywhere in the country. These are Sacramento's footprints. I took out, a, I took out some of the great ones I have that you'll see in a few minutes. This is Envision Central Texas, the Austin area. Do they want to grow around their belt route? Do they want to reestablish their small towns? Even Los Angeles. Here's how they would grow at their trend. Do they do a lot of infill? Do they build a fifth ring of belt routes around LA? You know, these kind of big picture questions about regions. By the way, in LA they found if they changed 2% of the land form, land use, they could cut congestion by 20% over 20 years. Now, does that sound like a pretty good proposition? You can only figure that out if you do this kind of scenarios work. Okay, these were our scenarios in Utah. Scenario A was just continuing to grow with large lots and things we were doing then. Scenario B was more compact, but, ma but mainly still larger lots. Scenario C, C started adding some transit and some centers and some mixed use in it. Scenario D was much denser and so on. Now, where do you think Utahns would pick once they saw all these modeled? Well, they said, well, how much land are we going to consume? How much ag land is going to be gone? You know, where will that land be? How many vehicle miles traveled are we going to go on these? How long are we going to spend in congestion? What are our emissions going to be in the air we all breathe together? What will the housing mix be like and will my kids have a place to live? Are we going to spend $37 billion for infrastructure or 23? All of those were questions they looked at and 600,000 Utahns were engaged. We had 17,000 actually answer the detailed questionnaires and then we surveyed them and the Utahns picked between C and D, which shocked everybody. We didn't call it smart growth, we called it quality growth. It was our growth. 
And then we came up with our own six goals and 42 strategies, and that's been going on since that time. Now, I'm going to skip and tell you what's changed. We went out and bought because we decided we wanted a multimodal transportation system. And I use transportation as an example. We, for $185 million, we bought 175 miles of rail line from the Union Pacific Railroad. and We created nine future transit corridors. We then figured out where that transit would go and kind of the land use changes in that small percent of the, our valleys. And we figured we could get a million people where they could walk less than 1,000 steps and get on a train in 20 years. A million people could walk less than 1,000 steps and get on a train, OK? Now, what does that mean? Well, at those stops, you've got all sorts of things, employment centers and walkable villages and housing. Now, a lot of our valleys are still single family homes like they've always been and will always be, I believe. But we learned to put density in the right places to make this transportation work. And we set out to create that transportation system with commuter rail on heavy rail tracks, light rail, which we built, and the bus systems. And these are some of the ads we used. The problem with waiting to solve Utah's escalating transportation crisis is the longer we wait, the longer we wait. What's the value we're going out? Act Wasting now to time. keep Utah moving. Vote for Proposition 3. Want to speed up your commute? There. That just saved you 15 years. Build needed tracks, lines, roads, and commuter rail 15 years sooner. Vote for Proposition See, 3. The chamber is the sponsor, the business community. In Utah, there are 80,000 more cars every year on our highways. If we wait to build more tracks, roads, and commuter rail, congestion will bury us. Vote for Proposition 3. Because too many cars is just no fun. Utah's traffic congestion will triple over the next 25 years. So before our transportation system gives out on us, we need to relieve the pressure. Vote for more tracks, roads, and commuter rail. Vote for Proposition 3. Uh, after the Envision Utah visioning process with the whole community being involved, 85% of the public supported this. It went from being a communist conspiracy to a great idea. And they voted twice to tax themselves to do it in increments. And since that time, this is what's been going on in Utah. We like classical music. That's when we, we're now building the five new rail lines. We already had four in place before that. Um, I'm going to skip that one. Hopefully this next one will come up. Now this is a multimodal system. Heavy rail, light rail, buses, specialty buses. More classical music. I know what some of you are thinking, I'd never ride that. Now, have you ever been on a street like this one, full of cars? How many of you have been on a congested street like this? Well, if we can just get a few people out of their cars and get some of you to walk and bike around and somebody to take the bus and the tracks or the high-speed the, the high rail system or whatever it is, look at, all, look at all the road I opened up for the rest of you with your SUVs. You benefit even though you never get on. In the rush hour in Salt Lake City, that track system running parallel to the freeway carries one full lane of traffic. We can't ever expand that freeway again. There's too much stuff on both sides. You want to double the capacity of the train? Double the number of cars. You want to double again? Double the headways. It is the most flexible system for our region you can possibly imagine. So there are lots of long-term reasons to think about it. It may not be a solution for you, but it's the kind of thing that came out of ours it was our choice, and, it was our, and then we were willing to pay for it to make this happen. Now, next you're going to hear from Boo Thomas, one of the great regional visioning uh, things that has gone on in America, if not the best, as Louisiana speaks after the hurricane, as a community rally to rescue itself 
um, and, to, and to plan a great future. The theme became build it back better when I was there, and so I'm just excited about that. But my last slide, just so you don't think we've lost our Western roots. That's why I said bank. You don't have to chase a bank. UTA Frontrunner, grand opening April 26th. Catch it if you can. Thank you, thank you very much. But I have a great opportunity tonight to introduce Boo Thomas. And Boo, uh, she received her, master, her master's degree in landscape architecture from LSU, of course. But the thing that's interesting, she is now the president and CEO of the Center for Planning Excellence. And that evolved from what was going on in Louisiana at the time that Cortina and Rita came through, and as we all know, devastated that area. But what she did is she was a head of an organization called the Center for Planning Guidance, but prior to that, she headed up the uh, Plan Baton Rouge organization, which looked at revitalizing the downtown and starting to come over some, overcome some of the issues. But when she moved ahead for the Center for Planning Excellence, the recovery process from, from these disasters enabled Louisiana to create what's called Louisiana Speaks. And as a result of that, in this one area, the southern part of Louisiana, over 27,000 South Louisiana residents voice their concerns and their thoughts about what should be done. And not only did she take that and move ahead with it, but I think you'll be very interested because I've asked her to tell you how much that cost and where they got the money. But she continues that today and the planning process that they have undertaken is now being, it's now being taken through all of, the, all of Louisiana and all of the parishes. A parish, I think, in Louisiana is a county in Colorado. She has been recognized by the Baton Rouge Chamber of Commerce, the Baton Rouge Business Report, LSU, and the Louisiana Architectural Foundation. As a matter of fact, in 2009, she and her organization, Center for Planning Excellence, they were awarded the Op Olmstead Medal by the American Society of Landscape Architects. But to carry that a little bit further, just recently, she was she became the second woman in Louisiana named to the American Society of Landscape Architects Council of Fellows. And that's, only, that's one of the highest honors, and it's only been given, as I said, to two individuals in Louisiana. So that's quite a tribute. Boo also asked me to keep this introduction very short, but please, me, please join me in welcoming Boo Thomas. Good evening. Thank you so much for having me. It's um, just delightful to see a little uh, Abbeville, Louisiana girl uh, coming to um, this beautiful northern Colorado uh, place and to be asked to speak about development and planning. When I drive through your communities and I see how well you've done everything, it's, pretty, it's a pretty amazing place. But as someone said this morning, um, y'all are so good. You just need to keep getting better. And if you don't, you know where you're going to go. <laughs> so you, you need to keep going up, going up. Um, let me tell you um, a little bit about who we are. The Center for Planning Excellence um, really believes passionately that our communities in Louisiana, given our incredible cultural assets, and as you hear me talk, you can almost take the words I say and say, this is northern Colorado. This is your area. We believe that we have incredible cultural assets, natural resources, and utter uniqueness that each Louisiana community has the potential to be the very best community and, uh, and it, we can be economically prosperous and resilient in our own unique way. In Louisiana, we haven't done much planning. We really 
um, did almost no planning, and if it was planning, it was done by an engineer, and it's still sitting on the shelf for the past 20 years. That's not the way we do it anymore. And we really believe what our mission, as our mission guides us, that um, every community in Louisiana can be made extraordinary through planning excellence. Um, so what do we do? And I think, forgive me, I'm going to read a little bit because I'll get so carried away in telling you stories. My staff said, stick to the script. So um, our work falls in two major categories, and that's outreach and education. And what's so important about that, and especially to you, is that we're trying to help communities understand the benefits and concepts like smart growth, or like Robert calls it, quality growth. That's kind of a bad word in Louisiana now. You don't, not supposed to call it smart growth, so I try not to. But if people like you don't understand the benefits of getting involved in a process like Embrace North, North Colorado, you're never going to, you're not going to be a part of this. You've got to understand what the benefits are and um, what's going to happen if you don't get involved. We focus very much on leadership development and we make sure that everything we do is community driven. We've got a number of outreach initiatives and uh, really work hard at bringing the message of good planning and quality of life to people across Louisiana. But we work in very small communities um, when we do that. Planning and implementation is the other thing that we do, and uh, we never start any planning process without the end in mind of saying, if you're not going to implement the plan, don't do it. Don't waste your money. I am going to talk about money in a minute, too. But um, I'm here really to talk about what happened after the storms of 2005. You remember that Hurricane Katrina was the worst uh, hurricane to ever hit the United States, the most deadly. And then exactly a month later, the third most deadly hurricane hit the United States, Rita. So we were reeling from Katrina. Had, you, had, you saw all the pictures. You know what we were going through. And we had yet another uh, catastrophe. Um, this plan that we developed, can you imagine the first storm was um, um, August 25th. The second one was September 28th. And in October, our governor's office called and said, called the little Plan Baton Rouge office, we were a division of the Baton Rouge Area Foundation, and asked, do you know of a, of, who would you try to hire to come and help us think 25 years out? We are talking right now in our office, all we talk about is rebuilding, where are we going to put these displaced people, how are we going to get them back, where's the floodwaters, I mean, what are we going to do? But the governor's office was already thinking, we've got to have hope, we've got to have a vision for the future being the smart plan as we were, we knew who could do the really great regional planning. We knew it was Envision Utah. And so I picked up the phone and said, who did that plan? And I got John Freganese on the phone in an airport one weekend, and he said, well, the person you need to talk to is Robert Groh, and he can help you develop the leadership team that you need to have before you even look at a consultant team. And that's really how this all began. So um, I'll tell you now how we funded that plan because I don't want you to keep worrying. This really was a plan totally funded by private funds. All this federal fun funding was flowing into Louisiana to help us rebuild from FEMA, from the emergency agencies from energy, you know, you name whatever federal agency, they were all down there, HUD, whatever. But this plan was funded by donations that were given to the Baton Rouge Area Foundation. They, they accepted almost $60 million of, fun, of donations from every state in the union, 45 foreign countries, and they went back to their donors and said, would you allow us to use your funds for planning, for looking at a visionary plan for the 35 parishes most affected by this hurricane, these two hurricanes, and let us develop a vision for the future of South Louisiana? And they said yes. The plan itself um, cost almost $2 million. The public outreach and everything else that went with it and doing all of these extra um, books and tools that we developed ended up costing almost $5 million. 
all private funds, not one dollar of tax money went into that plan, to this plan that I'm going to tell you about. With the creation of Louisiana Speaks Regional Plan, Louisiana became one of the few states to have a regional plan on this scale that incorporated coastal environments and the risk associated with those, and of course, you're not on the coast, but you've got a lot of water issues, don't you? Uh, land use, transportation, and economic development in one unified plan. The other amazing thing that we did, and I think that's, I hope why you're here tonight, is we had to find trusted citizen leaders. We did a value survey about this time and about, um, I think it was in December and January of 2005, 2006, and we surveyed almost 2,500 people and we asked them as one of the many survey questions, who do you trust the most and who do you trust the least? Well, they all, a lot of, they said, these the statesmen of our community, sometimes they named them, we ended up doing individual interviews of them, but the people they trusted least were a broad category of elected officials, and then we said, how about your local officials? They were very high up on the list, very interesting. Of course, we were having our troubles with federal officials at that point, too. So our Louisiana Speaks champions, of which there are about 150, across South Louisiana are the people that when they stood up and said, we endorse this plan, were the kind of person that if they were standing up on this stage tonight, you would say, oh, if they're a part of this, I want to be part of this. It was a very inclusive process. You're going to start to see a lot of the same things that um, Robert talked about. Very inclusive. We involved everybody. When you have a storm of this magnitude, um, you have to call on every resource that's possible. You don't have a storm, but you're having one that's coming. You have all of these people that, wanna, or that are going to move here, in addition to all those children you're having and the grandchildren. Katrina and Rita marked the beginning of a real culture shift for Louisiana, evidenced in plans being created and implemented, in public-private partnerships that never existed. And here's something that happened that is, should be interesting to you in horizontal and vertical alignments on, upon between public agencies, which had never spoken to each other before. And we began to see them cooperating and collaborating in a way that had never happened before. Uh, it, this whole Hurricane Katrina Rita thing, Louisiana Speaks, created a new level of, uh, and a new model of professional collaboration. We hired the best planning team you could ever imagine. Yes, they were all from out of state. No one in Louisiana had ever done a regional plan. We didn't even know what a regional plan was. How in the world could you do that? So we hired a great professional team. Um, we had um, uh, people from all over the nation, but also our local planners. And we fashioned a very unique plan where we had a multifaceted, we had a very small grain planning effort where we told people how to build back, actually how to build your houses, how to make them more hurricane proof. We also told them how to work within their parishes, came up with plans for that, neighborhood planning, and then the regional Louisiana Speaks regional plan. So what is the vision and what were these scenarios that we developed? Well, we looked at how we wanted to grow, coastal restoration, infrastructure investment, and storm protection. And we really found, uh, now you don't, have a, you don't have a coast here again, I'll, tell you, I'll remind you of that, but you have very important factors that affect each one of you, and that's why I think you're here. And as we heard in a session earlier, you have real issues here that are threatening the quality of life that you have. And the only way that you're going to deal with those are across county lines. They're across community lines. It's not what happens in Greeley that's going to stay in Greeley. It's what's going to happen to this whole region that you've got to protect. And there are ways that you can agree. There are, are ways you can come to consensus. And you've got to roll up your sleeves. So what else did we do? This whole plan, this Louisiana Speaks Regional Plan, um, is organized in three sections. We're looking at how do you recover sustainably, grow smarter, and think regionally. Louisiana, if we can do it, you certainly can do it. Um, for planner types like me, 
Um, this is a very exciting thing. I'd love for you to read the plan. I just reread it again last night. It's so inspirational. And it was really necessary to, prefer, to preserve the South Louisiana that I know. Now, North Louisiana is as different from South Louisiana as the Denver area is from you all. So can you imagine the little Cajun girl going up and taking the plan to North Louisiana, which was not involved in this effort, and saying, let me tell you about the plan, and let's see if you would like to embrace this. And how would you feel about a plan like this? And will you, are you interested in all? I will tell you, we were embraced. We had regional organizations formed. And when we have a governor that's more interested in doing things like this, um, I think we'll end up getting a plan for all of Louisiana. <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit about how we made all this happen. It was through the public participation. I told you we spent a lot of money on that. And remember, it wasn't your tax money. It wasn't any government funds. It was private donations. It really was the largest community planning outreach in U.S. history. Y'all might have had more people, but it's just bar barely. And so we I told you about the surveys, the workshops. We ate, engaged people and gave them choices and let them understand what the consequences of those choices were. And when given the ability to make these choices, and remember, we were doing this in the summer of 06. People still were not back in their houses. They still didn't know if they were going to have a job. They still didn't know um, h how was this state ever going to recover. But we had, um, we distributed all these newsletters. We did print radio, urban radio. Any kind of radio was the most effective. I'd never do TV again. Are there TV stations here? But it was very expensive. The other thing we did is we hung out in Walmarts. And we hung out at the student unions at the universities. And the students all knew because they had heard so much about it. We had friends that um, really think I'm crazy. We had over 100 public meetings, you've heard that before, where we had citizens, leaders, and elected officials who really became very enamored of the plan. Um, we, had, we got our public television station to do an Emmy-winning Emmy award video, award-winning video about the whole Louisiana Speaks process, got people to vote to, be, to take the survey while they watch TV, while, while they watch this. Where did we show it? We found where the greatest concentration of the diaspora were, and we showed it in those states, Memphis, Atlanta, Houston, Dallas, not in Salt Lake City. Um, but we were able to then use this whole email system, and I had friends that would call me from all over the state and say, don't ever send me another email again. You're killing me with all this. And so we really did use, and we didn't even have Twitter then. You have such an opportunity to use all this new media. You know, I don't do Facebook. I know many of you young people do. It's an amazing way to get people to weigh in, to be a part of this effort that's so important to your future. We had endorsements from the six major newspapers, from Texas to Louisiana. This has never happened before in Louisiana. And so what are the plan results? What has happened since that time? We've had some amazing successes. Uh, I just, one more slide, I love to brag on this one. Um, how much, po these, this is a result of the surveys and that, that polling that we did and we beat Envision Central Texas and Utah. We were determined. But the most amazing thing about this survey um, was that the demographics of the people who took the survey almost matched a one-to-one -one correlation with the demographics of South Louisiana. And that's pretty incredible when you realize what a very low-income, underserved community that we have across South Louisiana. Quickly, some of the results, and you know we're a, uh, we had never had the agencies in Louisiana that do coastal protection have to work with the agency that does coastal restoration. In fact, they were often working in complete opposite of each other. I'm sure y'all don't have that. But we did in Louisiana, because of the storms, they were forced to now become under one agency and have a master plan that's getting ready to be updated. Miracles do happen. Coastal Protection Restoration Authority. 93% of the people that took the survey said it was the extremely important or somewhat important to the future. 
Um, we also asked people, we're a big property rights state, that's why we were developing in the wetlands, that's why we were developing in flood prone areas that had a storm surge go over them. Because it's our property and we will build as we want, you can't tell me what to do. And after the storms, after going through something that was this horrific, we had 88% voting saying that they would, uh, they understood that there were trade-offs between risk and rights, and they said that 88% would support reducing community risk. And we've continued to see that. The politicians told us that would never happen. In fact, we did some crazy things after the storms of, um, refusing to allow anybody to, um, it's some ridiculous law about adjudicated property and property rights, but um, even, in, as a res even with that, we have changed the way we look at our property rights in Louisiana. Another great result, and I think this is something that you'll find out, do you want to keep, in, and you, Todd, found, do you want to keep developing as you are and have the consequences of developing like that, or do you want to modify development patterns or do you want to focus development? And that was astounding, that 81%. And that held, d depending, it didn't matter if you were in southwest Louisiana in the very rural area or in southeast Louisiana where New Orleans and the much more urbanized area is. So the results of the process is that there is a huge emphasis now on comprehensive planning. Prior to the storms, only 14 out of 64 parishes had any kind of a plan in place. Today, they're 29. Uh, that's only five years. It encouraged cooperation. I've talked about that. We have these great tools now. We have the, the pattern book that tells people how to build and how to build back smarter. We have toolkits of how to plan. We've made partnerships. We have our champions and citizens groups that continue to support this. We don't have an Office of State Planning. We did not, uh, we were not um, successful in that. That's why I think my little organization has taken on so many of these challenges because we don't. We have changed policies and we continue to work in uh, parishes. These, this is where we're working currently. And one of the amazing things is our Department of Economic Development was visiting in a bunch of parishes and regions throughout Louisiana and asking them, what is the number one obstacle to economic development? It wasn't number one, but number two was land use planning. So the Department of Economic Development actually uh, funded our land use toolkit, where it's like a zoning code you can pull off the internet and use it, and you will need a little assistance, but it's a very graphically oriented, easy to use, zoning code of all things for Louisiana, and each parish or town could adopt it. The Coastal Toolkit is in process. It's an amazing new place. I'm almost finished. The, and the consequences of the kind of growth that we have in Louisiana are that you have here are um, of, of not planned growth. It's all of these things you've been talking about already. Excuse me. But what we know is Louisiana is a very special place. Beautiful painting, but there are lots of scenes that, that almost rival that sunset tonight and that moon out there. So after the storms of 2005, all of that funding, thank you. Thank you. Raised by the Baton Rouge Area Foundation for the Louisiana Speaks Regional Plan since that, that time, Senator Mary Landrieu has been able to get funds for CPACs to go out and help communities because our own state didn't have the money to do that. We have um, seen an amazingly different disaster response after Gustav and Ike. You know, we had two more horrific hurricanes in 2008. The difference in the amount of destruction and the way we handled that after those storms was like night and day. So. We have learned, and then you're going to ask, how about the BP oil spill? How differently did you respond to that? Extremely differently and extremely well. There are still a lot of problems out there. I'm sure you all know Bill, Billy Nungesser, the president of Plaquemines Parish by now, who's been on TV regularly. 
But we did have a unified response. We did have parishes that came together, that listened to the governor, that had a unified response, and maybe they shouldn't have listened to the governor, but th no, they did. And so it's been a real good response, and Louisiana is changing, and it's really a privilege to talk to you tonight to see what kind of a community you have, and I have such high hopes. I can't wait to see what comes out of this effort, and you are very fortunate to have embraced Northern Colorado already in place and getting ready to just take off and very, very fortunate to have two community foundations and I'm just so um, impressed with the community. I don't know, I know very much about the Community Foundation of Northern Colorado and appreciate them and you bringing us in here. So with that, I'll end and John, you're gonna come up and Robert, okay. Thank you very much. So there are some forms um, that we ask you to fill out and you might have questions so please pass them down to the center aisle if you will or to the outside so that uh, the students can help us uh, pick those up and, and uh, we'll be happy to respond to those questions as we can. Um, tonight we have the pleasure of having Neil Best with uh, KUNC uh, Radio for Northern Colorado and Kate Hawthorne from the Radio. Northern Colorado Radio. Business Radio. Report who will moderate our question and answer period for us. I think what we want to try and do here tonight is first of all say, boo, I really like that radio, not television. Uh, you're my new hero. Um, <laughs> By the way, we love the print media too, just to make it clear. <laughs> I heard radio, so um, uh, what Kate and I want to do is try and go through and uh, we'll start off with a couple of questions. We'll try and group some questions together. So Kate, you got a question? I'm sure something that everybody from the business community would like to know. Uh, and this is for Robert and uh, also Mike Guile. But the first question is, where did the money come from for the first few years of Envision Utah? When Envision was formed, the uh, regional planning organization, the RPO, RTO, actually came together and said they would give us a $200,000 grant if in fact we could raise $70,000. And so we went out to the private sector, we went out to various organizations, and so we were able to raise that $70,000 to supplement the $200,000 grant. So that's in essence where the money comes from. Who are the funding partners? They go from the REAs to the Atmos Synergies, to the hospitals, the three hospitals serving Northern Colorado, to the Bro Company, and many others who came to the table to provide that money. So that's in essence how we're funding it. The way we funded Envision Utah was we established a three-year budget of a million and a half dollars. A third of that came from business, a third of it came from foundations, a third of it came from local government. The, the half million from, or, from local government was by far the most difficult to raise. It came in small thousand here, or five thousand there from small cities and towns all throughout the region. The business community was mainly Kennecott Copper, Geneva Steel, which I was running. Uh, all the banks, uh, members of the chambers of commerce, and so on. The government, uh, and then the foundations were the Eccles Foundation and a couple of other smaller foundations. And so we didn't ever raise a million and a half dollars. We set out to raise a million and a half dollars, and we ran a budget as if we would get it. And we collected almost that much over the three years, but we were running the risk all the way along. We weren't sure where the next dollar was coming some, from sometimes, to be honest. And so as we built momentum, people began to trust the process more and more, and the budget continued to flow in over time. Why should we accept population projections as a destiny? Are you saying we as a region have no say in our population numbers or growth rate is slow and or less growth an option? Well, I'm a, I'm a lawyer, and I'll just tell you that under the federal constitution, the right to travel is a, a, a permanent and f fixture of our life and the way we view our culture. People will come here if they're jobs. Jobs dis determine whether or not people will come and whether or not people will stay. So if you don't want it to grow, just don't produce jobs. If you produce jobs, you'll grow, and it's as inevitable as the sun is coming up tomorrow morning. And lots and lots of regions have thought about how to stop growth, and nobody has ever done it. So. 
it's, it's, there are lots of theories, but I've never heard of a successful place. And I've been to over 100 communities in America looking at growth issues. And so if you find one, let me know. I'd love to see it. OK, this one actually would be for Boo and Robert. But uh, given how important widespread and active public participation is for this type of effort, how did you attract and sustain public involvement in your process? We originally did it, um, you know, in that year and a half after the plan, by actually going to each of the regions and getting that group of champions and making, getting them to invite people to the meetings, and they would do the follow-up. So they were the ones that brought the people. I think when we began to have successes, that also brought people to the table. And so we've, that's been a real issue. When things start going well and you start having successes, the participation sort of falls off. So we've really done it now by the viral media and get doing through emails and uh, not so many public meetings. It, we earned a lot of media by having interesting stories. If you think about all the challenges you face, Northern Colorado, can't you think of some great stories that ought to be reported on in all of the media? And that drove the public involvement was the fact that as we learned what people wanted and told the story in terms of what they wanted and it touched them emotionally, the stories got bigger and bigger and better through the whole year and a half period and then it grew into the full vision. It's continued ever since. We run a major media campaign every January at Envision Utah on one of the issues. Kind of a follow-up question, Boo, and, uh, and, and, and push his issue a little bit further. Have the people of southern Louisiana voted to tax themselves to help pay for any of the improvements sought by Louisiana Speaks? Louisiana Speaks is really a vision at 30,000 square feet, 30,000 feet up, I mean. And so there were not specific projects. There were a few in there that were already funded, say, by the state that were highway improvements. We have what we have seen is we've done these comprehensive plans that followed the tenets of Louisiana Speaks. We have seen communities now tax themselves and use money in reserve to actually fund projects. My favorite was a community that had about, th these are small numbers for y'all, but $3 million to fix their sewer system. They couldn't decide where to put it. After they did their comprehensive plan, they then came together and decided exactly where to put it and they spent the money wisely and have continued to. Um, we've seen that same taxing, uh, we, you're not raising property taxes but they're voting to do uh, specific taxes for specific projects but on a very small scale, not huge increases. <laughs> All right, uh, Robert and maybe Boo, uh, are there any additional scenario studies you wish you had done or would do now if you had sufficient resources? Oh, <laughs> oh you should never ask that question. Uh, things that were not done in the original Vision Utah, we're starting up a visioning project in San Diego. We are doing health care. We're doing the future of education. Looking at 25 and 50 years, visions, not fixing today's problem. Um, health care and uh, and education have spatial components, but we're going to do the spatial and non-spatial components, how to position a region to be first in class in education 25 and 50 years out, given all the technology changes that are coming, for example. So yes, there are, there are lots of subsidiary issues, and we've gone back in Envision Utah and added those issues. And when we did the update six years after the first vision, and we're in the middle of sort of doing an update right now, we check back in fairly regularly to make sure we're headed in the right direction. We just got the plan adopted in May of 2007, so we have not done an official update yet. And there are plenty of things, especially healthcare and education, because you know we are one of the poorest states in the nation. And so that is one of the issues. We also wish that we had spent a lot more time and energy on trying to forecast other transportation modes, i.e. rail, so that we could actually keep up with the rest of the country and this new uh, stimulus package? There is sort of a follow-up here. Uh, it's reasonable to assume that mistakes were made in Envision Utah. And uh, could you share one or two? You know, I was running the second largest industry in the state as an officer when this started up. And so I came from a law background, an engineering background, and a business background. 
Uh, we had just started when the arts community arrived in my office and had told me they'd been left out and how could I possibly not understand their role in transportation. I said, well, help me. And they said, well, we're, all our stuff is downtown, the symphony, the ballet, and so on. People are, it's getting harder and harder to get downtown. So we care deeply about the success of the transportation questions. And so we left people out. With that list of 113 people who were eventually the partnership, the list started at 85. And so our biggest mistake was not seeing everybody else who ought to be at the table, no matter how hard we tried. Uh, any other big mistakes? We were learning as we went. There, we did not have a detailed plan. We made it up as we went. So it sounds pretty spectacularly planned out. We, we were lucky. Lucky. <laughs> uh, the question is, am I correct in assuming that this Utah organization is taking steps to appeal to the community to get support in selling their services to Colorado government? No. <laughs> yeah, Envision Utah's mandate is to serve Utah first. They've, done a, they've helped a couple of communities. They've helped Wyoming do a value study recently. They helped Montana uh, to help, a, do, help one community, but they're not in the business of serving other communities. And what was interesting, I meant to say in my presentation, Robert Groh came down to Louisiana to help us fashion our whole Champions campaign, our values uh, situation, uh, five times. We never paid him a penny, and he paid his own expenses. And that just shows you the kind of man that he is. But he also believes in Envision Utah so much that that was why he did it, too. Thank you, Robert. We have several questions kind of around the same uh, theme, so we'll just uh, let uh, Boo talk to this one, and maybe you'll have something. But uh, did and or how did Louisiana Speaks cross racial community lines to make planning inclusive to the diversity in the region? And it's also the other questions are about the socioeconomic differences and how you address that. Ooh. That was a huge issue and a huge um, passion of mine that I felt that if we just did a plan with the usual suspects and they all look like me, then it would certainly be my plan and nobody else's and it would not represent the community. We spent an amazing amount of time. We actually had a consultant out of um, Austin. You might know her dad, Dan Rather, but I didn't know that when, we, when she became part of our team. Robin Rather spent a lot of time with us identifying who the uh, African American leaders were, who the Vietnamese leaders were, who the uh, Spanish leaders were. And we went out and personally recruited them, uh, translated the survey into Vietnamese and Spanish. We went to their community centers where they were working together on projects and explained, had translators, we worked very hard. But in the African American community, it was very difficult because they really, um, our friends in the African American community did not trust the whole planning thing. And I know you heard a lot of the controversy about the you not plan in New Orleans, but um, we actually went to the churches because that's really where the power lies in um, Louisiana is with the black churches. And so we went to their leaders, we got them, we went to their churches, we didn't ask them to come to us. And so we, that's why when I bragged about our surveys and we gathered the demographics of those 23,000, however many, took that survey, we also got the demographic information and that was what I was most, uh, proud of is that the African American respondents exceeded the percentage of African Americans that were in each of the regions. So we did it, and, and they're our biggest um, supporter today. Our communications director during this was multilingual and of uh, Hispanic nationality, and she, she uh, helped us hold workshops in uh, Spanish uh, all over our community. That was our biggest group. We invited others. We, that was the only one we focused on, particularly in terms of well, Utah will be 20% Hispanic in about another 10 years, just to give you a sense of the growth rate that's occurring where we are. So that's a big focus of Envision Utah today. And maybe that one I, other issues we're focusing on, one of them is the, the high school graduation rates and the educational component for our Hispanic families. 
This question was addressed uh, to, to you, Mike. Uh, perhaps Angie will have some thoughts as well. Our communities currently hold many joint meetings and cooperate in all these areas. Why do our elected officials need to attend more meetings? You know, I think I'll just ask Angie to answer that one. No, I'm just kidding. But th that is a great question. Um, first of all, we have talked to the elected officials. And the elected officials have some concerns. Obviously, they have some concerns. You've heard what happened in Envision Utah. We are working through those concerns. Are they going to be attending more meetings? They could be attending some meetings, but most of this plan will be put together by the people who will come together who have an interest in developing this plan, improving this plan, and making it available to everybody in these two count in the two counties. So as far as more as more meetings, yeah, there will be some more meetings. But on the other hand, most of the work is going to be done by a group of individuals who come together to not only develop the plan, but figure out ways to implement the plan. Just to add that, you know, I think part of what our role here is to try to create toolkits to help the public officials make the decisions that they need to make every day. So we're not trying to add to their burden or make them attend more meetings. We're trying to act as a resource, uh, just as these two examples have so that as they're making their decisions they're required to make and the pressure of that, we're adding t tools to their toolkit to make that planning uh, to see how their decisions fit in the regional context. Come back up, Angie, please. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a follow-up. I think you know, the, some folks have concerns. Many people believe that Embrace Colorado is a tool to encourage, accelerate, and fund population growth in northern Colorado. And the direct question is, are they right or wrong? I'll tell you my opinion, and I, I don't see this group as a, a growth engine group. And I know we talk a lot about smart growth and some of the other organizations that have done this. Uh, this discussion comes up quite a bit. The statistics are what they are. We're reacting to some uh, promises by these statistics that growth is coming our way. We can debate that. But personally, my opinion is if, if the goal is to slow growth or to stop growth in this region, given the statistics and the data we have today, the enormity of that effort of slowing and stopping this growth has to come not at a local level, not at an individual level, but at a regional level. If that becomes the goal from the people that again get involved with this organization, we have to work together to achieve that goal. It's enormous. So that's how we feel about any of the issues that may come ahead uh, for this group. Uh, air quality, water, transportation, these are all issues that are beyond our local borders and local boundaries. So. That was an issue in Utah, so you'll know, and uh, basically the way we approached it was we're getting ready. If they come, we're going to be ready. If they don't come, you know, that's, that's another scenario that we didn't play out. But the fact was they came, and looking back 15 years, I don't know anybody who regrets that we thought about those problems and started to come together. And so, you know, the, there's a famous advertisement that was done when Ronald Reagan ran for president called The Bear in the Woods. Anybody remember it? It was about whether or not he was too trigger happy to be the president of the United States. And it just showed a bear lumbering around in the woods and said, some say people say there's a bear in the woods, some people say there's not. But there might be, shouldn't we be prepared for the bear in the woods? And that's sort of the way this is. This is about, is growth coming? Probably. Is it inevitable? Maybe. But if you don't plan for it and it comes, things will be a lot worse off. And so that's the way we approached it. I don't think anybody looking back who had those concerns still has it. As the, as the institution and planning brought the growth, the growth came anyway. Neil, who is the timekeeper of all time, tells us this is the last question. Uh, what can we do to keep our conversation about growth forward focused? Didn't say who was supposed to answer it, so. Feel free. You know, the, one of the big challenges will, will be not to get drug into the problem of today. This is about thinking of how to solve problems over the long term. And we had a big highway project planned in northern Utah. And both sides wanted Envision Utah to pick up that problem and, and find the solution. And the, my biggest challenge early on was just keep saying to everybody, this is not about tomorrow. It's not about next year. 
but it's about the next 25 years. And once you figure that out, you can reverse engineer how you want to get to that 25-year horizon that the people choose. And so stay out of the short-term battles is a big part of the answer. The other thing is you just got to keep talking. I mean, the reason you're here is you're all interested. Uh, Boo and I look like we're champions. We sort of did it by ourselves. There's nothing further from the truth. I stood up and 100 people stood up with me, and then 1,000 people stood up with the 100, and then another 5,000 stood up. And pretty quickly, everybody was thinking about it and involved and talking about it around their kitchen tables. And that's how it happens. It's about a network of people who care about this place and love this place. I mean, the question, it's not unlikely 50 years from now, in 2050, somebody asked the question, what person has had the most impact on the future of Louisiana in the last half century? It's not unlikely the answer to that question will be Boo Thomas. But the first thing I know she'll say is, I did not do it by myself. There were thousands and thousands of great people who stood up with me, and it was all about a wonderful team and a tremendous network of people who just loved that place as their home. That's how I feel about Envision Utah. It's not me. It's a whole bunch of us. And everybody went back into their own domain and caused things to happen. That light rail, it's not built by Envision Utah. It's built by the Utah Transit Authority. You know, the, the balance with the roads, that's done by the Utah Department of Transportation. The cities are planning the nodes around them, not Envision Utah. We're, we're, an, we're a place that sets tables and invites people to a dialogue. And that's what Brace Northern Colorado is. Come, share, be involved and decide if you really want to be a champion yourself for your children and your grandchildren. I think we have time for just, I looked at my watch, I think we can squeeze in one more question because we have several about transportation and, and relating to the Utah plan and then uh, both Boo and Robert have asked if they could have one minute at the end to, to summarize some thoughts. Uh, so let, let me touch on three questions related to transportation because that's been an issue in our part of the world. Uh, what happened to rail freight when rail corridors were used for passenger service as part of one, uh, first part? Secondly, exactly how much congestion has been relieved by transit in Utah and what kind of road improvements have been avoided or eliminated, I guess? And finally, how did Utah deal with the concern if we build transportation capacity, will that encourage growth? Rail freight, big issue for regions that are for our, our freight hubs. Chicago did Metropolis 2020, woke up in the middle and said, we have the largest inland port in America, we haven't even thought about the freight. And so if you are that kind of a place, you need to think about your freight. What we've done is not impacted. We've shared easements and so on. We bought a lot of surplus easements from one of the SP merged with the UP. So we've been careful about that, but not as careful as we should have been. I'm working on a National Transportation Research Board study on how to protect freight rail across America right now. And there's a lot that needs to be done at the local government level to do that, do that better. Second question was? Uh, has to do with the, uh, uh, how much uh, congestion has been relieved by transit. Uh, one lane off I-15, so it's a four-lane road, one lane going that way. Uh, we're, we're, we only have 40% of the system in place today we will have in three years. So it's just going to get better from here. But it, it's having a big effect, but it's best effect is during rush hour. Because that's when you get people out of their cars, that's when they're most likely to use it is on those those commute trips. And what was the third one? And quickly, the third part is uh, how did you, do, in Utah, did you deal with the issue of if we build transportation capacity, that will encourage growth? Um, the Sierra Club was part of Envision Utah. That was their worst concern, is if you build a road to somewhere, it'll bring growth. It actually works the other way around. People move out there, the kids move out there, they drive till they can qualify for a house and a loan, and they'll go as far out as they have to where the land's cheap enough. So what, what puts them out there is the housing prices, not the transportation system. And then the transportation system is required to catch up. The head of UDOT called me the legislature one day and said, will you explain to these legislators how we never create another Eagle Mountain, which is one of those low cost places to live in Utah? And I said, well, fix the housing prices and that's the answer. Anyway, they move there because they can afford it there, not, not because the system makes it or inspires it. I want Robert to have the last word. You see how inspirational he is and how much he gave to our community and helped us get to where we needed to get to. Um, my final thought to you is just that uh, you have a chance to form that vision and remember without a vision, the people perish. And without a vision, North Car Colorado will not be what it is today. Thank you.
I just want to thank you for having Boo and me come. This has been a great opportunity. We both have talked about and felt the, the spirit of the place. Somebody, somebody wrote on their board this afternoon in the workshop, we don't want to lose that entrepreneurial spirit. We don't want to lose that can-do spirit. We don't want to lose the sense of optimism we have. That's what makes regions get better. It's what makes great places, is that sense of we can get it done, we can work together, we can make it better. And so we invite you to continue on that. We look forward to coming back and seeing your progress. And I really hate to follow Robert, but uh, I've been asked to just say a few words in closing. Um, you know, hopefully the statistics ahead of us that we're seeing each day tend to make us feel a bit powerless. But hopefully we've shown that, there, that we do have a, have a choice. Uh, in the workshop today, one of the uh, individuals at my table said the thing they value, we were talking about the things they value most about the area in this region. And what he said he valued most is that he still feels like an individual can make a difference in northern Colorado. With some effort, we can make a difference. And so that's what this is about. Um, I really challenge you to become involved with this organization and the planning efforts that are, that are moving forward. Um, I wanted to th say a quick thank you both to Boo and Robert for being here today to sharing their experiences with us. Uh, a warm thanks to the Center for Public De Deliberation who today helped uh, facilitate our workshops. Uh, one of the key issues that talk was talked about at many of the tables was water. It's certainly a fundamental issue for the region. Uh, and just to, I want to make a quick announcement. There is a water forum that has been planned uh, coming up soon. It's uh, supported by, it's being uh, put together by CSU, a, a collaboration of CSU, the Community Foundation of Northern Colorado, and University City Connections. It's a public forum. You're welcome to attend. Again, it's about uh, it's water issues, and it's February 3rd at 5 p.m at the Larimer County Courthouse in Fort Collins. So I encourage you to attend, and I encourage you to uh, get involved as individuals into this, in this regional discussion. Um, our choices today can shape the communities of tomorrow. So um, the last thing is we have a small reception, so we can continue the conversation here at the back of the room. Thank you all for coming today.